All right, Patricia, take it away. Think we're All right. Start in? Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm Patricia Mock, and uh, I have the pleasure of being the Family Nights Out coordinator here at the Edible Schoolyard in Berkeley, California. Um, I use the pronouns she, her, hers. And I've been with Edible Schoolyard Project about uh, six years, first as a parent volunteer and then um, uh, on staff here. So thank you very much for inviting us into your homes, your work, uh, wherever it is that you're Zooming from. It's a great um, privilege for us to be able to share this time with you and share some of the work that we do. So thank you all. Um, I just want to thank Nick Lee and Russell Sturton for being our tech, um, tech crew tonight. And they've yes. made all these sessions go seamlessly. They've just been so well done. So thank you, Nick and Russell. And um, I am just going to turn it over to um, Grizz, uh, Griselda then. Again, thank you. My name is Griselda Cooney, and I use the pronouns she, her. I am a chef teacher here at the Edible Schoolyard, and I also have uh, managed the, our family engagement uh, program for the last 10 years, um, up until this year with, when Patricia um, joined um, the team. So we're super excited to share, you know, our best practices that we have used and some strategies that could help you maybe start family engagement um, in, your, in your communities, in your schools. Um, and then also we'll have an opportunity to kind of like share what has worked for you and what uh, has not. Um, Russell, can you start the slideshow please? Thank you. So in this session, like it says here, um, you are going to get an opportunity to hear from us about our um, family engagement program that's called Family Nights Out. And now because of COVID, it's Family Nights In. And you will experience how a Family Nights class is structured and hear about some of our best practices and strategies for building family engagement. Next uh, slide, Russell, please. This is our agenda. Of course, we've already welcomed everybody into uh, our kitchen classroom. And um, I'm going to share a little bit of history of how uh, our programming started and why. Um, Patricia is going to lead us into a demo of what a typical Family Nights in class looks like. And that's when you're gonna have an opportunity to get your tools and your vegetables uh, and cook along if you like, or you're welcome to just sit back, relax and enjoy the show. And then after that, uh, I will share those best practices and strategies for building family engagement. We'll have time hopefully for Q and A, we'll have a Padlet for you to engage with and everybody's gonna be joining in a raffle tonight. And then we will have our closing. Uh, next slide, Russell, please. Okay, so before I talk about what we're making tonight or what Patricia is going to demo um, tonight. I just wanted to kind of share um, a little history of this, uh, this programming that we have here at Edible Schoolyard. And I will start off by saying that I also started as a parent volunteer here at the Edible Schoolyard. And I started volunteering when my daughter started sixth grade. She is now 26 years old, living in Spain cooking amazing meals. And um, as a volunteer, I noticed how wonderful everything that was happening in the kitchen classroom. Um, and I wanted as a parent to show other families what happened in this space. And so I um, implemented this program and it has looked very different uh, throughout the years. We're in our 10th year of programming and we've had some real successes and also some real challenges. And ultimately now um, our biggest success is that now we have um, 
you know, this, this many years in, we have learned some things that uh, we get uh, to share uh, with you uh, today. So originally when the program started, there was no, um, we engaged with the community, but not in a very structured way. We would, you know, support in certain events. We would hold our plant sale. We would go to, um, you know, the Harvest Fair at school campus. We would join PTA meetings, but nothing like structured, like, like our program, um, our family engagement program. And in the beginning, when we started, we tried many different uh, ways of engaging with our families. And we found that um, doing it on a weekly, on a weekly uh, basis on the same night uh, has worked really well um, our, for our families to attend. And they were held in the evenings. In the beginning, we also offered um, classes on the weekend and uh, those kind of worked. Um, but we have found that holding um, the evening classes at the same time, um, you know, on a consist consistent day worked really well uh, for our community. And um, one, one thing that I, I feel is super important is to engage with your, um, with your community and get to know your community. I will talk a little bit more about that um, in the strategies and um, best practices. But ultimately the way that the family nights out classes were structured is they mirror a kitchen class, a typical kitchen class. So what that means is that when the students come to the kitchen during the school day with their history teacher, whatever they were cooking during the day, we would take that lesson and make it into a meal. We would add a protein or maybe a salad. And uh, that ensured that the students knew what was going on. And in turn, the students became the teachers. And um, that's how we have um, kept the, the structure of our, of our program. There is some times where we will have some one-off classes, like maybe the after-school um, coach, like soccer coach will come to me and say, can we host the soccer team and have like a nutrition class? So we do have some of those, and we also partnered with different groups on campus, like our ELD, our AVID groups, and um, offer uh, some, some classes uh, for them. So um, the Family Nights Out um, was very successful because families would come to our space, to our kitchen where we are at right now, where Patricia is. And if you were in our earlier session, actually yesterday session, you uh, got to hear from us about how the kitchen is structured. So there's three tables. So we would be able to host about 30 people um, in one family class. And it was multi-generational. So we have, we're very intentional of having tools for younger students, cheese graters, um, peelers, wavy knives, for little um, little ones to 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 participate in in our cooking um, in the cooking experience. So that is a little bit of the history of how Family Nights Out has evolved and has um, grown. Now, what is really cool is that we it's coming like it's kind of like an institution now. Like families want to make sure that during their time at MLK or Martin Luther King, that they at least go to one um, family night in because that is like a right, like a kind of like, we did that in middle school, kind of like um, a camp in elementary school or something. So it has become kind of like an institution where families are, are fighting to like, <laughs> to get a slot into our, uh, our cooking nights. In the beginning, we would just have um, family sign, find, sign up and they would be first come first serve. But then through the years, we figured that um, to make it more equitable, we started to have people join a raffle and they would sign up 
and then our our we have a system where randomize um, the families who could attend, and that's how we uh, were able to um, make sure that everybody who wanted to come could come. And if you didn't make it in sixth grade, you would sign up again in seventh grade, and then um, in eighth grade. So. Unfortunately, we, of course, we have a big student uh, body. We have about a thousand students here on campus and we cannot hold that many people in our, um, in our kitchen. Even if we had um, like two days a week, I feel like we couldn't, we couldn't host everyone, but um, we really are mindful of that. And now with like this um, mode of participation with the virtual and remote learning, we have another ability to, um, to be able to engage with families in a different way and have, you know, not just 30 people, but tonight we have how many people? 62 families joining, and we don't know how many people are joining with all of you. So yes, this virtual space is an awesome um, way for us to engage and offer this programming to um, more people. Um, so now I know that, um, you're going to have questions and, um, please feel, feel free to use the chat. We will try to get, um, the, to answer your questions as we go along. And we also will have a Padlet that Russell will put in, in the chat in, in a little bit for you to ask questions. Um, and we'll try to answer them as, as we can. All right, so Patricia, I think I'm gonna turn it over to you now to talk okay. about how we had to adapt Family Nights Out into Family Nights In. Great. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Griselda. So um, last year, uh, we, uh, so in the 2021 school year, it was the students went to school virtually. They were not here on campus at all. But um, Edible Schoolyard Kitchen still managed to hold virtual classes um, so that uh, the families could get a peek into the kitchen. They could see, have an opportunity to build community um, find out more about our program. Um, we packed up tea bags and uh, herbs uh, at the beginning of the school as a welcome to the sixth grade families. Um, so we did as much programming as we could, um, despite the fact that there were no students on campus. Um, this year, uh, the 21-22 school year, um, we pivoted the program a little bit again, uh, where we were able to have students back into the um, classroom, including the kitchen and the garden classrooms. Um, but outside visitors um, were not allowed onto the campus. So parents had to drop their kids off at the school gates um, or just drop them off by car. So we weren't unfortunately able to welcome families into our kitchen classroom to hold our family nights out. So what we did was we pivoted to a virtual format. So what we did was about um, once or twice a month, uh, we would hold a virtual family nights out. We would choose a recipe based on uh, what group of students we had seen. So we usually tried to time it so that uh, when the sixth graders came in, they came in for about four or five times into the kitchen classroom. We would try to time the uh, family nights in the virtual class towards the end of their rotation. So they'd have had an opportunity to learn skills, to learn recipes, to be familiar with cooking, to build their knife skills, to build uh, their vocabulary around cooking. And um, what we wanted was um, for the, the student to become the teacher for their families. So um, some of the ex examples of some of the uh, lessons that we taught vir virtually, we did a lesson on roasted honey nut chips. So small honey nut squashes. We taught the students in the classroom how to cut them and then season them with 
olive oil and salt and pepper, put them into a, a sheet pan and then roast them off in an oven and they were delicious. So a lot of the students had never tried that before. So we did that as a virtual family nights in class. Um, we did one where we did other roasted vegetables and we made a salsa verde with uh, parsley and lemon zest and capers and olive oil. That was delicious. And what we did for each one of the virtual um, family nights in is we would publicize it through uh, Google Classroom, through the classroom teachers, uh, through the PTA eTree, um, and make announcements so that it had the largest reach possible to all the families. And uh, the day, either the day before or the day of the uh, virtual family nights in cooking class, um, we would pack up a, a kit of ingredients. So it might have some vegetables, some roasted, ca some carrots and some celery or some kale and chard and uh, collard greens. We oftentimes would pack up little small portions of the uh, ingredients, some of the seasonings um, that were used. So like soy sauce and sesame oil. And the students would stop by the kitchen classroom at the end of the school day and they would pick up the ingredient kits and take it home so that they could cook along um, at home with their families during our, our uh, family nights in cooking class. So it was super fun. It was really, really fun. And um, the parents really enjoyed it because since they weren't able to come on campus, they were able to get a peek into our kitchen classroom. They were able to see what their student had been experiencing in their classroom. So um, I think everybody really enjoyed it. And what we really liked about it is that the student becomes the teacher. The student has learned knife skills. They've learned you know, the correct way to hold a knife, uh, which part of the stem of the collard greens we're gonna eat or not eat, uh, whether or not you eat the stem on the chart. So they learned all that and they were able to um, then show their families what they had learned. So, um, so let's see, what else? Um, we provided the kits. Uh, we did a lot of outreach. Um, the family nights in were grade specific. So we'd have a sixth grade family nights in, you know, reflecting on a, a recipe that they had learned in sixth grade, uh, seventh grade, eighth grade. We did family nights in for some of the English language uh, learner uh, groups. So where they would meet like I think every month or two. So the one of the English language learner um, teachers asked if we could specifically hold the family nights in class for the families, um, the EL families. So we did that. Um, we had classes for, as Griselda mentioned, for our AVID program, which is um, oftentimes, it's a, it's a pathway to college for a lot of uh, families where their first generation, the student would be the first generation to go to college. So we worked with different, different groups in addition to the grade specific um, family nights out or family nights in. So that was a lot of fun. It, it kind of broadened our reach. And because it was virtual, we could, reach more families. It wasn't limited to the space in our kitchen, the number of you know, people that we could fit around a table. So that was really great. So um, let's see. Um, we, when we um, uh, provided the kits, we would send home a copy of the recipe so that everybody would have it. We have you know, the vegetable fried rice. I don't know if you can see this. Um, we'd send it home with all the ingredients so that everybody, if they were gonna cook along at home, they would have a list of the ingredients and the technique and the, and the different steps. So um, they could follow along. Patricia, um, there's a, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but there's a question in the chat. Um, who helps you do all the packaging for the ingredient kits? That sounds like a big job. Um, I did it. Um, it wasn't a big job. I would basically 
figure out what ingredients we were, or first we'd figure out what recipe we wanted to feature. And then we would figure out um, what ingredients we wanted to put in the kit. And based on the registrations, we just do a, a very simple Google form as a registration. Um, and based on the number of families that registered, I would just go down the street to Monterey Market and pick up all the ingredients and then pack them up into little bags for the students um, to pick up and along with a paper copy of the recipe. So it wasn't a big task at all. It was, and it was fun. And it was really fun to see the students when they'd stop by and say, you know, I, you know, I'm supposed to pick up something for the class. And I'm like, great, you know, and so their students, you know, they're here during the daytime and then it was fun to see them again after school and then later in the evening during the class. So. Yeah, and I also want to mention that um, we are very fortunate here at the Edible Schoolyard that we have a staff member designated to um, do, just do family nights um, in and family nights out. And also Patricia subs substitutes for the three teachers that are on, uh, on staff. So that is a real luxury to be able to have someone designated just for this, um, this program. So I understand when you say, you know, it is a big job because if it is just you who is the teacher who is also teaching and also putting kids together, it is, it is a big job. And we, we, um, we acknowledge that. Um, so we, um, if, if that was the case, if it was just me, I would ask maybe students to come and help or maybe um, recruit a club to come and help me make kits. And, um, you know, there's, there's, it is, um, we are very fortunate to be able to have the funding. I see a question about where, how is this program funded? Uh, to have the funding to be able to provide uh, ingredients to our families as well. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to um, just put that out there. Um, but uh, go ahead, Patricia. I think there's gonna be more questions and I'm not gonna be able to answer all of them, um, but I, we will have time to do more Q&A and you'll have time to put them in the, uh, in the Padlet. Thank you. Go ahead, Patricia. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, what else? We hold the classes about once a month. Um, sometimes we are able to do twice a month, and you know, depending on the school schedule, we may not just to we may not schedule one in December just because recognizing that it's uh, the students are only there for half a month and then they go on to winter break. So, but roughly it was about once a month um, that we held the classes. So. Um, so, um, the lesson we're going to do tonight that, um, I'm going to be demonstrating was a seventh grade lesson, uh, the fried rice. And it was, um, a class where we were, um, doing it in conjunction with the seventh grade curriculum. Um, so on the Song dynasty. So, um, Grizz can talk, um, more about that, um, and we have a visual right up here. Um, yeah, thank you, Patricia. So um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, a lot of our lessons are tied to what is being taught in the history uh, class. And so the students come with their history teacher to the kitchen. And we meet with the teachers before, um, you know, during the school year and, and ask them like what, uh, what lessons or what units are you teaching and how can we support um, the learning? Because that was like a big um, deal for us um, because you know we don't wanna take away from instructional minutes from the actual academic teachers. So we had to uh, make sure that um, the learning that was happening in the classroom could continue for teachers and administrators to understand that um, you know this is not just a kitchen where we're teaching them to cook. This is actually a kitchen classroom where learn all type of learning can happen. And so as you can see here, our visual for this lesson, it is about the Song Dynasty and it's a seventh grade unit that the seventh graders um, learn. And sometimes this will be a preview to a lesson depending on when the students come in or it can be a review 
of what they've already uh, learned in the in the classroom. So we take the main components of like the lesson and we try to um, put it on a visual. We're really big on visuals and this is our chalkboard. And we try to put information up to where the students can actually just read the story themselves. We actually did this lesson and we had um, students cook the rice and do the fried rice and do the experience about the rice. And then afterwards, after we ate, we had students volunteer to come up and actually tell the story of the rice. And um, as you can see here, this was um, during the Song Dynasty where there was new tools that were uh, developed. Plus um, there was a discovery of a quick growing rice. So then that, if you follow down, um, led to like a rice surplus. So what do you do with the rice surplus? You get growth in population. You start to um, have time to change, uh, 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 trade your rice for other things. And then, um, then that, that led to urbanization. So farmers who were working in farms now maybe had time to uh, you know, go to town and, and build uh, different um, town cities and become more urban. And then that led to like having more time to create art, to create ideas and to create culture. So um, we always have a visual component to almost all of our lessons, whether they are tied to the curriculum or not. We um, feel that we want to make sure that all of the things that we do in the classroom are, um, we're very intentional of like multi um, learners. So like we think about uh, the different learning styles for, for everyone. And so this is why we, we um, always try to have, you know, handwritten recipes, our visuals are hand drawn. Um, and we uh, have multiple ways for, for our students to engage with, with, the, um, with the information that we're trying to, um, to show them. Thank you, Patricia. Hey. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Griselda. So um, let's go ahead and dive into the recipe. So um, when we create a kit for the students when they're doing the um, virtual family nights in, we just send them uh, home with a bunch of, of vegetables. So tonight I have carrots, I have celery, um, we have some beautiful broccolini from our garden. Uh, we have scallions. We have uh, gorgeous eggs from our edible schoolyard chickens. Uh, we have some edamame, uh, which is frozen. Uh, there's soybeans. Um, we also have some gorgeous sugar snap peas that were harvested from our garden. Um, so the reason we like this um, recipe is it's so adaptable. It's so flexible. You can use whatever vegetables you have at home. And say you have one little carrot, this kind of sad carrot in the bottom of your crisper drawer, you can use that. You have like one stalk of, of broccoli, you could use up that. You have, you know, one more piece of celery, you could use that. So um, you could also use um, a bag of frozen vegetables, like a bag of peas and carrots and corn from the frozen vegetable section at the grocery store. So it's a super flexible recipe. We like using it for that reason. Um, I have rice that I cooked yesterday. Um, we always recommend that um, you use either, that you don't use fresh cook that you just came, that just came out of the rice cooker or just came out of the pot. Um, I made this last night and then I let it dry out because you want the rice to be a little bit dry. Otherwise it'll stick to the wok. If you, use, if you cook the rice just before you're gonna cook it, it's gonna be too, too moist. There's gonna be too much moisture and it's gonna stick all together. So you want to have rice that's had an opportunity to dry out a little bit. Um, Church, for I, just wanna, I just, hold on one second. I just wanna let people know that Russell put the recipe in the chat. 
So if you are going to kind of follow along um, cooking, you can um, bring that up and, um, and have that. Um, and there's a question here, who creates your recipe cards? Love how simple and colorful they are, very artistic. So um, we all take turns. I personally, I'm not the best artist, and, but I try. But um, we all um, write up the recipes. So thank you. Sorry, Patricia, go ahead. No, that's fine. So in the recipe, um, it does say that you can use five cups of vegetables. And like I said, you know, any variety of, of vegetables, that's great. Just any mixture. Um, when I make it at home, um, and I do make fried rice pretty often at home, um, I like to have uh, um, a variety of colors. So I'll try to have, a, um, you know, use carrots because I like the orange. I'll use some um, broccoli or oftentimes I'll put some gailan, which is Chinese broccoli. Um, you can use celery. Um, so just a variety. Um, another good thing um, is, uh, you know, that makes it flexible is you can add whatever kind of protein you want in it. Um, here in our kitchen classroom, all the dishes that we cook are vegetarian. So the protein would come from eggs. Um, it could come from soybeans if we're adding soybeans. Um, but if you're cooking at home and you want to add another protein, if you wanted to add chicken, for example, or ham or Chinese barbecued pork or shrimp, you could add any of those and it'd be all delicious. So, um, so that's uh, one of the great things we like about it. Also about the rice, you know, anytime I go to a Chinese restaurant and have rice, I always take the leftover rice home because it's always, there's always leftover rice. So I'll just pack that up and bring it home. And then the next day I can make a little quick thing of fried rice. So um, never waste the, the, uh, the white rice. So um, you can also make it with brown rice. There's a, a brown jasmine rice that's delicious that you could use if you don't want to use white rice. Um, so for seasonings, we use what you know I think of as basic to any Chinese um, recipe, which are scallions, ginger, and garlic. So pretty much just about any recipe you're going to use um, will have those ingredients. So. Um, and then we use for the other ingredients, the seasoning, uh, we have sesame oil. Let's see if you can see it, sesame oil. And then, sorry, soy sauce. So, um, and it could be tamari if you're gluten-free or just regular soy sauce, any of those would work, okay? So when we teach this to our students, what we're doing is we are, um, this is a practice on their knife skills. So we like to use this lesson because there's quite a bit of chopping involved, chopping, mincing, dicing. They can use, uh, they can learn different ways to, um, to do the knife cuts. So what we're gonna be teaching them is, so we always teach them to use the claw. So the claw being where you tuck your, your fingertips under and you're gonna use the knife and you want to make sure that you're not gonna have your fingers out because you don't wanna risk uh, cutting it. And then just, uh, there's a couple of ways you could do it. You could do it in like little coins. So they're just little round bits. You wanna cut all the vegetables pretty small um, just because this is meant to be cooked quickly. Um, so you can do it in little, so you could cut the carrots so they turn out into little bitty coins. Another way you could do it is you, we teach the students to um, do a julienne and they're gonna turn the, turn the knife at, at like a 45 degree angle to the vegetable. So, and you can cut that way. And then what happens is then you wind up with a slice that has more surface area and then they can cut it into 
match sticks. And if they want to do a dice, then they can cook it. I mean, they can cut it again. Um, so they're more like little cubes. So either way is fine, depending on, um, you know, the size of your carrot. So, um, but uh, the, the main point, I think, is that you want the vegetables to be pretty much the same size, fairly small, because uh, when you're cooking, um, this cooking method, the stir fry in a wok, everything should cook quickly. And so you can't have big chunks of um, vegetables because they're just going to take too long. Um, we have our sugar snap peas. You could either cut it straight down and have pieces like that. Or if you want to just change the look a little, you can cut it on a diagonal and then you have pieces like that. And you want to use the whole thing, the pea included. So. Um, Let's see, we've got edamame, you can, uh, these I took out of, uh, they just come um, out of the pod, just like straight like this, frozen, so you can use that. Um, for celery, we would tell the students that they can just cut straight down. If they want, they could cut on the diagonal and you get slightly different ones. If they, if the, when, as you get towards the, the base of the celery, it starts getting bigger. So then you can just kind of cut it down the middle and then you have smaller pieces that way. So um, what else? We have, we have the broccolini that came from our garden and we tell the students you can eat the whole thing. You eat the stalk as well as the flowers. So um what we could do is you could just what i would probably do is just cut down the stem and then cut it across that way then you have nice size bite for and they're all about the same size as the carrots and the sugar snap peas um let's see what else scallions Scallions, I like to cut the scallions on a bias just because I think it looks pretty. So cut off the, the root end and you just kind of cut it on a diagonal. And I use the whole thing. I use both the white and the green part. So, um, and when you cut it on a diagonal, I just think it looks pretty with, you know, or you can, if you wanted to just cut straight down the little coins, you could do that too. That works out just fine. So, um, what else? That's pretty much our vegetables. Um, for the seasoning, we use garlic and ginger. Um, one thing that we show our students to peel the ginger. What we do is you could use a vegetable peeler but ginger has all these little bumps and curves. So it's kind of hard to get in there with a vegetable peeler or a potato peeler. So we just use a spoon. So you just take the spoon and you just use the bowl of the spoon. And this is nice fresh ginger. So the peel comes off re really easily. And it just makes it a lot easier to get around those bumps and those little curved sections of the ginger. So, um, and then with the ginger and the garlic, what we like to do is um, we want those to be minced. Um, so into tiny pieces. So you could slice it. And then what the, one technique that we teach our students is to mince is to hold, to use your fingers to hold down the knife on this end and then to get a firm grip on the other end, the handle end. And then what you wanna do is you just kind of go up and down. And so the knife is kind of pivoting on this end and you're using gravity 
and um, just the motion of the knife to get nice small pieces. So I happen to like my ginger minced really small because I don't really, I love the flavor of ginger, but I don't really want to bite into a big hunk of ginger. So, um, and then you can just kind of keep uh, chopping the ginger till you get it pretty small. So, um, so that's something. Uh, let me grab one tool. Well, Patricia's grabbing the tool. Um, if you joined our uh, kitchen, uh, exploring the kitchen classroom infrastructures and systems, um, just want to make a note to um, our knife safety uh, and habits and rules that we kind of, um, you know, that's like uh, one of the first lessons that all students uh, in sixth grade um, get. Before we start cooking, we design a whole lesson on just talking about um, what it means to be in a kitchen with real tools, real knives. And we talk about, you know, being physically safe in the kitchen and also emotionally safe and what those two mean. And um, we always um, are very intentional of, you know, letting them know that we are trusting them with like real, um, real tools. And um, every time that they come into the kitchen, you know, after they start using the knives, maybe we'll say, do you guys need a quick review on the knives? We will go over the, the, um, the knife, uh, kind of how we're going to engage with the knives in the kitchen. And um, it's, it's for us, it's super important uh, for them to, um, you know, know how to use them and feel comfortable. And you'll have some students who do not feel comfortable you know, using an eight inch or um, uh, an eight inch chef knife. So that's why we have other tools, like I said before, um, of for them to be able to participate in the way that they feel um, like they're able to participate. Go ahead, Patricia. Okay, thank you. So uh, one tool that I grabbed was the bench scraper. So we use this all the time in the classroom. And one of the uses that we um, teach the students is to use it to get the food that's stuck onto your knife. So rather than use your fingertip to uh, get on the knife, uh, get all the food off the knife, we use the bench scraper. And then it's also a really great way to scoop up all the food from your cutting board and put it into the wok or putting into a bowl or something like that. So. Um, this is another thing that we use to, um, to um, just emphasize the safety aspect with knife safety with the students. So, um, so I've got my minced ginger garlic. Um, this is um, a tool that um, often will, we try to get this, we get all the students to identify all the tools in our toolbox. And this is the one that probably stumps them the most often. So we'll say, what is this tool? You know, does anybody know what it is? Have you ever used it? And, um, you know, more often than not, it's something new to them. So it's a garlic peeler. So we take the, the garlic and we put it in this little plastic tube. And then what we do is we just kind of, kind of squash the garlic a little bit. Sorry if I'm moving the camera. And you just kind of use the um, heel of your hand and then you squash it in there. And then what happens is that loosens up the skin of the garlic. I didn't do it very well, but, um, and it just makes it easier to get the, the skin of the garlic off. There we go. So then you've got this garlic and it's really easy to separate the skin and you just compost the skin. So um, again, with the garlic, I don't like to bite into a big hunk of garlic. So I tend to want to mince it pretty small. So I kind of cut it into smaller bits and then you do the same thing where you're gonna hold the edge of the knife and then just kind of pivot around so you have a nice small um, mitts. 
So um, that is, then I'm going to use my bench scraper, clean off my knife that way. Another thing that we teach our students is if you uh, cut this way, then it's easy, it's, it's, doesn't wear the knives down as much. If you go keep going like this, you're cutting and, and you're getting contact all the time this way with the, the cutting board, it's actually gonna dull the knives um, really quickly. So we say, you know, in order to keep our knives um, working well in good working condition, we're gonna use um, a method where you're gonna um, chop this way. So um, that is pretty much the ingredients, I think. Um, so what we do is we use a wok and we have um, two burners at each cooking station. So the instructions are to um, turn the heat up high on the wok, on the burner. Um, and when you're cooking with a wok, the, um, it's a quick cooking method. It's not like braising or something where it's a low and slow cooking method. It's, it's something meant to be done quickly and at high heat. So we heat up the wok, high heat. Uh, the wok is designed where you can use the whole surface. Um, this is a portion, the bottom portion is what has contact with the heating element, but then the sides of the wok get um, hot as well. So you can wind up use, you know, having food um, up on the sides. It doesn't just have to be confined to this bottom part of the wok. So um, if you don't have a wok at home, you can certainly do it in a big skillet. Um, I've done that before. It's really easy. Um, and just, you know, I think the key is using high heat. Um, let's see. One thing we want to do is we want to get the wok hot before you add the oil. We use canola oil, so you heat up the wok, add the oil, and wait till it gets hot. And then we um, start uh, with the aromatics. So we start cooking the, um, the ginger and the garlic, um, and you know, because you want that to then to release their oils and start to flavor everything else that's gonna go into the pan. Um, when we teach this lesson to the students um, in the classroom, we have them divide up the ingredients because um, the, with the wok being um, a cooking method where it's supposed to be fast and hot, you don't want to overload it. So you don't want to pile it completely full of, of ingredients of all the, the food that you're cooking. So we have the students divide it up. So, you know, put half of the veggies in this bowl and half the veggies in that bowl. And then that way that we can divide the, the students into two groups. So they each get a chance to cook. So, you know, we'll have the first group cooking, um, you know, half the batch. And the second group, maybe they're cleaning off their table. Um, if you're doing it at home, depending on how big, you know, how much you're cooking, how large a portion you're doing, you may or may not need to divide it into half. But when we're doing it in the kitchen classroom, we have them um, do half the ingredients, do a half batch at a time. Um, what else? Uh, we use eggs. We use, you know, protein. Uh, in the recipe, um, it has you uh, beat the eggs, uh, beat up the eggs in a bowl and add the soy sauce to it. So it's already flavored. And then after um, the rice and the veggies have been cooked in, in the wok, then you kind of clear out a space in the wok at the bottom and clear out like a, a hole at the bottom or a well. And then you add the eggs in and then the eggs will scramble uh, in the wok and um, then you can kind of incorporate them into the rice and the veggies. So um, let's see. Um, I think that's it. Griselda, I don't know if you can think if I missed anything in the recipe. No, um, you didn't. Um, is there any questions? I know that um, we all want um, the show you chicken recipe from 
food memory. <laughs> from the food memory uh, that's been um, kind of asked by a couple folks here on the chat. Um, so if there is uh, no questions about how we teach the fried rice, um, I'm going to start kind of talking about um, some of the best practices and strategies that we have here uh, to engage our families. Any last uh, questions, minute questions for Patricia on any of her um, talking points? My right, to be honest, the rice doesn't last long enough for me to freeze it. I have heard that um, as a way to make it, you know, super easy to whip up a batch of fried rice. I just haven't tried it, but I have seen, seen that recommended before. I just haven't tried it. Yeah, I, I actually have. I um, We cook a lot of Mexican um, rice in my house and it actually works really well. Um, you, I just freeze it into little, you know, portions like two cup portions and I'll take it out and I will not, um, defrost it. I will kind of break it up and I will put it in my, in my pot or in my pan, um, frozen so that it doesn't have, um, a lot of time to sit and it might get too, um, too mushy. So thank you. That's a great question. Any other questions? I see, um, Amy, you love the, the tech uh, knife skills. I need to practice those. We, are, we will be able to send you our resource that we use when we're teaching our knife um, skills to our, our, our students. I will have uh, Russell, if you can make a note to send that resource out, I think that'd be great. And I believe we have like an awesome video um, on our website. Is that uh, correct, Russell or teaching team? I think there's a, a yeah. source. Yeah, we do. Um, no, we have a, a few resources on uh, knife skills. And so we can include a few of those in the follow-up. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So if nobody has any other questions, we're going to move on to um, kind of the next kind of portion of our time together. And that is uh, Edible Schoolyards Projects, Best Practices and Strategies for Community Engagement. And um, some of the things that we have through the years uh, kind of learned is, um, you know, the power of yes. The power of yes is um, really kind of like a motto that we have here. We always think really hard before we can't say we can't before we can't do anything or we say no to somebody um we always try to find ways to accommodate requests uh, or support uh new ideas so that's a practice that we have here and also when we're inviting people into our spaces and when we ask people to gather uh for a meeting or for um you know just to come and talk to us we always come with a food uh, element to those meetings or when they come into our space. We'll offer them tea, we will have fruit or a vegetable that we harvest from, um, from, the, um, from the garden. And also we just love to make our spaces look beautiful. If I'm going into a PTA meeting, I will bring uh, flowers, I will bring something to share with the people. Um, that is something that we, uh, we do often. Um, and then, like I said before, our, our cooking nights, our engagement, our family cooking nights mirror what is happening in the classroom. So we want to make sure that the students feel empowered. We want to empower our students to be able to um, showcase what they're learning in the, class, in, in the classroom to their families. And most important, most important, I feel, is soliciting feedback. We're always asking for students to give us feedback, for um, families to give us feedback. And we offer, um, solicit, we solicit feedback on the moment, like at the end class, 
or we will send surveys to our, uh, our families and our students because we also want to make sure that, you know, we learn, like I said before, learn from, um, from what they, how they experience um, the events that we, that we hold. Um, yeah, be intentional about creating an inclusive space. Um, make your space welcome to all communities. Um, you know, and also make sure that people have a good time, that it's fun. Um, don't overthink things. It's, you know, cooking and what happens in a kitchen, people drop their guards. So just be authentic and be yourself. And people will, will, will see that. Um, and when, when you make it to where it's like fun and make fun of yourself, like, it's okay. I don't know everything. Um, I will joke about, look, I just cut myself using the knife. I'm the teacher, but I'm also a learner. And we all are, um, you know, here to learn from each other. So those are some of the kind of best practices that, that we have used for um, building community engagement. And then some strategies that um, we have is, you know, student involvement. Students are your biggest height man like they are the ones that are going to go in back home and talk about your program and talk about how awesome it was and how fun it was so use them um engage with them get to know them ask them you know what their families do um how they like to spend their evenings or weekends um you know allow your students to also demonstrate to be part of of the cooking experience uh, you know, sometimes when we were doing the family nights out, I would invite a student to come up and talk about the lesson, kind of like we have the, um, the fried rice lesson. Some students are really comfortable there. They would go up there and like talk all about the lesson that the academic component, or they would sh demonstrate a knife skill. Um, so the more that you can involve, uh, your students, uh, I feel, we feel that that, um, they're going to be more um, able to go home and like hype up your program and make sure that they that they come. I mean, not too many kids want to leave school and then come back in the evening, right? But we have the opposite. Kids want to come back to our program. They want to hang out with um, with us in the kitchen. So use them. They are um, an invaluable asset to uh, to your program. And uh, like I said before, offer uh, classes to different groups um, on your campus. If, if you have that, even offer the teachers to come or the counselors to come um, to your space. And if you don't have a kitchen classroom, you can hold cooking outside. In the previous sessions, we um, offered uh, also resources called No Kitchen, No Problem, where you can create a kit that you can go and um, do cooking activities in, uh, in the garden space or in the cafeteria or in the teacher's lounge or even the library. Um, another kind of component, component for um, family engagement is family outreach. Uh, make your events you know, multi-generational, uh, have tools for younger children, like I said, and um, you know, invite families to, to share their knowledge also. Um, we're very uh, fortunate here at King that we have 22 different languages spoken here. And when we invite families, we sometimes, you know, we don't present a, a lesson that we've taught. Maybe we'll have a potluck or we'll have a grandma come and teach the class um, how to preserve something or how to make a special dessert. So, um, you know, involving your families is also uh, an amazing uh, strategy. And, you know, one way that I have, um, and Patricia, and all of us here actually at Edible, we make personal connections with, with our community whenever we can. We will be at, you know, pick up or drop off uh, just so that we can wave and say hi, uh, so we, they can get to know who we are. We make phone calls to invite families. We know that, especially now with, you know, our tech that we have available to us. It might just be easy just to be like, I'm just gonna send a text to all the families or I'm gonna send an email. But there's something really powerful of an actual phone call. When you actually take the time to dial a number and call, people are surprised. They're like, why are you calling me? Is my kid in trouble? Most families, what happens is 
they only get phone calls home when it's a negative uh, situation. And you'd be surprised how many families are shocked that I call. And I'm like, oh, hi, this is Miss Griselda from the kitchen. What, what, did, what did he do today? And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> your, your child's not in trouble. I'm just calling to invite you to a cookie night uh, for, us to, uh, for us to come together and build community. And that is, um, in my experience in the last 10 years, is one of the most important aspects of engaging with with our um, with our community. Um, we also have uh, you know we have the uh, um, announcements like the daily announcements for um, for our students. So we will make announcements. We'll also we'll also send out flyers. We know most of those flyers end up at the bottom of backpacks. You know when the students get home, so they probably don't see them. The families don't see them, but we always remind them. Some some teachers actually will ask them to bring something signed that they handed the the uh, the flyer to to the parent. Um, now we have Google Classroom. We have um, you know teachers communicate with the families through Google Classroom, and um, we have parent teacher conferences. If we're having an event, when is parent teacher conferences? We will have signs up where the parents are coming into the classes for the uh, for the families to see that these events are happening. Um, and you know, for uh, another thing to think about is uh, to make your events, of course, accessible to everyone, regardless of like the economic situation of our families, and then offer them multiple different times of the week. And um, as you uh, do the programming, you're going to find that some days are, are, um, are better for, uh, than others for, uh, for your community. Here at King, we have found through the years that Thursday nights are like a good night um, for us to hold our, our uh, family uh, engagement nights. Um, and then one kind of um, last bucket that we, I want to kind of touch base on is um, using your school and your broader community as well. So um, like I said, get to know all of your administrators, your teachers, go to staff meetings, go to PTA meetings, introduce yourself, go to after school events or sports banquets. Um, the more that people see you um, and, and, you, talk, and you, you talk about your program, the more people are going to start like talking about it um, and you know, get more engagement that way. Um, you know, here in Berkeley, a lot of our Berkeley high students, um, they have to do community hours and they're always looking for um, organizations and places for them to volunteer. And so we actually, pre-COVID, we had a very robust program um, that we had our high school, we had an high school internship program where we worked with uh, workability and they would um, send us a list of high schoolers who uh, were in, who were interested in looking for work. And then we would, we would um, recruit. We would go to the high school and have interviews with students. And then they would come and work for us. And the work was, uh, you know, leading tables, um, help setting up, help with the, um, with the cleanup. And it also turned out that it wasn't just helping family nights out. It was, it became a program that we were teaching like how to write a resume, how to do interviews, how to uh, fill out timesheets. It's, it's a great, if you have uh, like a call, even a college too, or like a high school, see how you can uh, get them involved in, in your program. Uh, here at King, and actually in at BUSD, Berkeley Unified District, we have a, a really robust volunteer um, uh, program where if you want to volunteer in any of the schools, you have to go through a volunteer um, uh, uh, program and you have to go to, um, yeah, I think you have to get fingerprinted. And so we utilize them also because there, there's, you know, people who want to volunteer. So utilize um, all the resources that you can get um, 
for volunteers and, uh, you know, offer parents um, volunteer opportunities as well. Of course, with COVID, you know, we couldn't do that these last two years, but we're really hoping that in the future we'll be able to, um, to bring uh, volunteers back onto our campus. Uh, another thing is to think about your local businesses and uh, other organizations that are willing to give you donations um, that can support your program. Um, we have, you know, Monterey Market where we source um, the ingredients that we can't grow, that we're not growing in our, in our garden. And they give us a discount every time that we, that we buy from them. So, you know, think about who's in your area that can support your work. Um, and, you know, also, like I said, get to know your community, see what other events are happening in your community that you can get involved in and, um, you know, and just, just use them as a resource. So those are some of our um, best practices and strategies that we have uh, used. And I know there's more, and I know that some of you have been doing this work for a long time. So uh, Russell, if you don't mind, can you open up the Padlet or uh, share the Padlet? Um, and we're going to ask you to take a couple minutes. We have some questions on the Padlet that you can answer. Um, and actually I see a question on here. Do you ever have local chefs present? Any, tip, any tips on how to approach them? We have. We have um, used uh, local uh, chefs. And the, the one thing that I would say is that if you're going to invite people into your space, make sure that they are familiar with what you're teaching, what your mission is, um, what your curriculum um, is, so that you know, it, 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 they understand like your um, offer for them to come and volunteer and, and see a class in action so that they're not coming in brand new and like um, not knowing what, uh, you know, what happens in your programs. Um, let's see, I think we've had in the past had um, some events where we did a Thanksgiving um, meal one year where we had a local chef come actually a chez panisse chef come and all we cooked uh turkeys we did like a whole thanksgiving meal um that night it was very ambitious it was a lot of work but um we cooked a, we cooked turkeys we made mashed potatoes and we had a local chef um a chez panisse chef come and actually show us how to um cut up a turkey and that was like a really cool uh, way to involve involved your uh, a chef where they just had a component of the evening. And I learned a lot of how to like, you know, cut the breast and the legs and the wings. Um, so yeah, I, I, would, I would recommend that, that if you have that avail available, um, I, I, would, I would definitely um, invite them. So if we are going into the Padlet, thank you, I see already some folks in here already. And here are some um, questions. What are ways that you engage families into your community? And the other one is, what are some challenges you experience around family engagement? And then what are some resources, school, community, et cetera, that could support your family engagement work? And what questions do you have about family engagement? Um, I wanna say that this Padlet is going to be available to you even after we get off uh, this Zoom call. And I already um, really love all of these um, answers to these questions. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. This is not just for us, it's for you to use, um, you know, to, to uh, it's, a, it's a tool for you to use to learn and to network um, with others. So, uh, Annie, you need to know how to cut a turkey. I know, it's not easy, <laughs> not easy at all. 
<laughs> maybe we should have a session on that <laughs> how to how to cut a turkey and or a chicken <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for um, all of your uh, participation and engaging um, with us tonight. We're going to keep the Padlet going. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Patricia. I know we're uh, coming close to the end of our session here. And um, we are going to, let's see, should we answer more questions or should we, let's see, is there any questions here? What are some challenges that you might have before we go into our closing? Okay, Patricia, is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'll see some of the challenges. What are they? Getting people to actually come who sign up. Ooh. Yes, that's a good one. You know, we all mean well, like obviously I am a parent and I get really excited about something and yes, I'm going to go do this thing. And then the day comes and I'm just like, oh my goodness, I overscheduled myself. I'm overbooked. Um, so that happens. Um, you know, we uh, actually call the day before um, our events. We call to just confirm uh, and we make it a point to say, you know, it's really important for us to know if you're going to come because we need to purchase ingredients and we want to make sure that we have enough ingredients. So if, if you um, if you say you're coming and you don't come, you know, it, it just making that phone call could probably help you with um, making sure that people, one, remember that the event is happening and uh, two, make them kind of feel like, bad if they say they're coming and they don't come <laughs> you can just be like it would be really nice if we knew how many people were coming because we want to make sure that we have enough ingredients for people and what uh, i what i would say is you know when you're publicizing um your family nights out or family nights in or whatever the community event is there's kind of a, a sweet spot in terms of how far in advance you send out the information how how far in advance do you publicize it because if you send it too far in advance it kind of falls off of people's radar um, if you send it too close to the event then people are already booked up or they have piano lessons or clarinet or soccer practice or you know any of the million things that everybody has going on in their lives so you know i kind of through trial and error we found that you know that maybe a week to 10 days is a good time so that it's people are aware of it they might put you know they'll put it on their calendar they're likely to know what's going on uh, you know a week or 10 days from now um, but it's it's not so far that you know they've completely forgotten about it in the you know from when they signed up so um, and no, you know, people, people have lives, families have lives. So it's inevitable, you know, that, that there'll be times where people register, they have every intention and want to do it, but something happens. So that's fine. And, you know, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll send the, you know, follow up and just say, we missed you, you know, hope you can join us. Um, another time when we do it, you know, hope everything's okay. You know, here's a link to the recipe. This is what you missed. You know, um, just a way to stay engaged with them, a way to stay in contact with with the families. So, yeah, um, that's a great one, Patricia. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Our fa families don't answer the phone. What do you do when they don't answer the phone? Just keep calling. <laughs> Hang up. Dial again. Hang up. Dial again. No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, just all you can do is leave a message and then I'll ask maybe the students say, hey, you know, I, I tried calling your um, your folks uh, and they didn't answer. Do they know about um, the the event we're having? Um, again, using uh, your students uh, as your resource. And I understand sometimes when you're talking about like elementary schoolers or something, it might not um, it might not work 
that well, maybe sending a little note home. Uh, yeah, or maybe having, uh, if they don't know who you are, maybe having the teacher email them and say, you know, such and such is going to give you a call um, to talk, to invite you to, uh, to one of the uh, cooking events or something. So yeah, we have last minute, no shows, time schedule. I'm sure like all areas, there are working and stay at home parents. So at times we have events at 530, but not all parents are home because some families who work in town can't get home in time. Maybe we could record the event and have those available too. Yeah, that's, you know, that's something that we, because of COVID, we now acknowledge that not everybody can come onto campus, right? And so even when um, hopefully we'll be able to host family nights out, we're still going to keep the family nights in um, program because we do feel like there's, we can have a broader reach of, of folks who can attend. And if they're pre-recorded, then you can just, they can have them, um, um, not pre-recorded, but if, if they're recorded, then they can have access to them, um, you know, uh, another time when, when they're able to watch it. So, uh, thank you for that. Let's see, what else? Um, thank you for the resources. Those are all wonderful. And then some questions. I'm looking at the time and I, and I want to um, answer all of them. I'll just say really quickly, how do you fund the Family Nights Inn? Is this free offering for the families? Yes, it is free for the families. Uh, in the past, when it was Family Nights Out, we would ask for donations if they would like, but we, um, we're very fortunate again to have funding. Uh, our PTA actually funds a big chunk of our program. Um, so we are able to offer, um, this program for free. So, um, I'm looking at the time and we have about 10 more minutes and I think I'm going to turn it over to Patricia, but don't worry if your question was not answered, we will, uh, have access to the Padlet. We will answer your questions and you will have this, um, Russell will send this, um, to you in a follow-up, um, email. Okay, um, let's see, Patricia, do you want to do the, um, the raffle? Yes. Yay! Yay! Raffle time. <laughs> so everyone get it, come off mute. And we are going to do a little drum roll. Actually, we're all winners, right? Because we're all here. We're all learning about how to engage better with our families. And we get to spend an amazing evening together. Um, so yeah, thank you. Hi. Yes. Hi. 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 Um, so Patricia, what is everybody going to win tonight? So tonight, hi, Tom. <laughs> hi, sweetie. Um, tonight, everybody's a winner. <laughs> like Ms. Uh, we're going to share with everybody a copy of our digital cookbook. So this was created uh, last year uh, while the students were um, doing remote learning, but we wanted to have a way to connect with the students. So the kitchen teachers created this um, digital cookbook that had all the recipes that uh, we shared with the students. It had little videos in it with the starring role of Miss Thais. Um, <laughs> and just, you know, a really beautiful, heartfelt um, way to connect with our students when we couldn't physically be with them in the classroom. So everybody's gonna get a link to our digital um, cookbook. So everybody wins. Everybody's a winner. It's kind of like, you know, being on the opera, Oprah show. Everybody, look under your seats. Everybody, <laughs> can keep your book. <laughs> you win, and you win, and you win. <laughs> yeah, so this um, digital cookbook is amazing. Uh, if you click on some of the image on the lemon curd, you'll see um, Ms. Thais created these amazing videos um, that 
We actually use this uh, cookbook all the time. We share it with our families. This is another way to, um, if your families cannot um, attend, this is another way that you can engage with them is by sending you know, the recipes home, maybe some videos. Um, and then also, you know, if they cannot attend, if you offer ingredients, maybe they just come and pick up the ingredients. So uh, many different ways to engage with families. And um, we hope that you found this uh, session useful and that you can go and do some really amazing work. I know we are all doing amazing work and um, let us know, we're, we're happy to help you. Um, and we will definitely answer all these questions. And if you think of a question, maybe tomorrow or over the weekend, feel free to um, email us at trainings at edibleschoolyard.org. Um, but folks, again, thank you so much. It's a privilege and honor to be with you all tonight. And um, you're awesome and you're amazing. And now let's go for us. We're like getting ready to go to summer, like summer. Like we are just like so excited because this is our last uh, session and we officially start summer. Um, so enjoy your summer. Hopefully you have a restful time to rejuvenate and be ready for the uh, fall to greet our wonderful humans that we get to, um, to be with. So thank you so much. And um, have a wonderful summer and enjoy the cookbook. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank Thanks you. for joining us.